style uh, session today, but really it's ask us anything. You'll see everybody here is, um, uh, or at least on video right now, is um, part of our TechSoup team. So usually we hold these um, virtual office hours every month. Um, last month we did one on Teams. So if you um, want to get access to that, we have that recording available. So if anybody's looking for information on how to set up your Teams or how to use your Microsoft Teams account, um, feel free to look at that. Um, we've done past sessions on setting up your um, Microsoft 365 administrative account, deploying your licenses and getting the most out of your office licenses. So if you haven't joined us for any of those, there are some um, that are recorded and available. And as we move forward in the rest of the year, we'll have a few more events that we do. And our goal is to really set up on topics that are most important to you. So on today's session, we thought we'd change it up a bit and really just make it really open um, and have a forum for you to ask any questions that you really have. And it doesn't have to be related to any specific product solution. It could be anything um, that we might be able to support you and help you with. So a few housekeeping rules. Um, there's a chat function um, for you to use. It's the one that's highlighted in the orange box on your kind of toolbar at the bottom. So you can use that to type any questions or comments that you might have. For anybody who needs closed captioning, um, you can click the three little marks um, underneath that uh, toolbar and turn on live captioning. And for this session, we don't have, you know, we have a small group here. We want to make sure that you get your questions answered. So feel free to come off of mute and ask your questions live. And you can see that um, mute button and unmute button option that's available to you as well. So our agenda today is really simple. Um, we're just going to introduce ourselves and talk to you a little bit about the questions that we can answer. Um, and then if you want to start putting in any of questions that you might have into chat, feel free to do that. Um, and we'll start going through all of your questions. So I will pause there and I'll do my first introduction, which is myself. Uh, my name is Shruti Ramaswamy. Um, I, you can ask me anything about the Microsoft um, program, any of the Microsoft offerings that we have, or if you've heard or gotten any emails about our new quad membership, I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. And then I will pass it off to Kevin. Thanks, Rudy. My name is Kevin Mohal. I'm a technical customer success manager here at TechSoup. Um, I can also uh, primarily uh, assist you with your Microsoft questions. I carry multiple Microsoft certifications, but in my role and capacity, I need to be dangerous at just about everything that we offer. So if I don't know the answer, I lean on the people that are here with me to help uh, find the solutions that uh, you are trying to seek. So I will pass that on over. Uh, let's go to Julie. Hi, I'm Julie. I can answer questions about Autodesk, AWS, Tableau, and GrantStation. Awesome. And we just had a great GrantStation promotion. I hope all of you guys take advantage of that. Um, Cameron, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Cameron Jones, and uh, you can ask me anything about TechSoup services, uh, hardware programs, or TechSoup courses. Awesome. Steffi, how about you? Hi everyone, my name is Steffi um, and you can ask me anything of regarding Zoom. Great. Naysan? Hi everyone, my name is Naysan. Uh, thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions regarding any one of our cybersecurity offerings, please send it my way. Perfect. All right, and uh, Matika, do you wanna? Yeah, hi, my name is Matika Ankatawanit. I work in um, the marketing communications department. And if you have anything that is not covered by these lovely <laughs> people, um, you can always reach out to me and I can help you with the rest. Awesome. Yeah. And then Bailey, I don't see you on video, but if you want to introduce yourself really quickly, that'd be great. Hi, everyone. My name is Bailey. Um, you can ask me anything about Adobe, Asana, Intuit, and VMware. Perfect. OK. So I'm going to look at our questions if we have anything coming in so far, um, but we did have a question that was entered beforehand. Um, Willow said, Stephanie, did you say Zoom? <laughs> um, so she did say Zoom. So if you have any questions, feel free to put that into chat right now. Um, we had one question to start off and kick off the conversation that came in um, in the um, submission form that we had. And so we'll kick off with that question um, that we had, and then we'll get to any questions that you have in chat as they're coming in. So I'll say the first question, and I'll probably 
you know, um, have Kevin maybe take a stab at answering this, um, came from uh, the Oasis Sanctuary Foundation. Being a non-IT person, I'm tasked with installing 11 seats of our authorized Microsoft Business 365 premium licenses to 10 new computers plus my own computer. I find the experience with my own computer that any pre-installed Office product must first be uninstalled before trying to implement the cloud solution. Um, and from my experience, I was unable after doing the uninstall to actually set up the licenses. Finally resorted to installing a desktop installation of Pro Plus so I could just do my work. How do we get help installing a comprehensive cloud-based app and get it to work? So Kevin, do you want to start? And then maybe Cameron, if you want to highlight some of the service offerings that we have on that as well, that'd be great. Yeah, so depending on the operating system, um, we're talking Mac OS or PC, uh, the download itself is really having to understand like the file directory system. So you have absolute and relative file paths. I'm not going to get into the technical components of that right in the, for this instance, but the the main executable file and its subfiles. So think of like the, the main executable file for running. It's called a DLL file for running uh, Office, the Office installer. That and its corresponding subfolders, which would be the actual applications themselves, their other executable files and other file types exist. Everything needs to be essentially wiped from the system because you cannot write a, a download over an existing download, even if there's trace files of that. So there's a couple of different ways that you can ensure that it's wiped completely uh, from, uh, from your most likely your C drive. Um, but in the case of like kind of where you're at now, like um, you're kind of in a position where you've already kind of added uh, on-premise back to your environment. Uh, it's kind of a good and bad thing if you did not want to operate with the on-premise and wanted to take advantage of the entitlement. Um, it's actually really simple. There is something that you created as part of the deployment called an XML or answer file. Um, I can I can happily connect with this person. I can actually even um, maybe even just even add it to the digital transformation forum. Uh, there's a real simple script that you type. Uh, it just it literally just says remove. Uh, so that's all you have to do to modify that file and it will wipe all the absolute file and then the relative file pass for the entire download, at which point you'll just want to restart your computer. And then you could use like for the case of the 365 entitlement, you could um, use that installment and it should be a clean install. Um, but uh, I'll toss that over to Cameron because we do have a service. It's all of what I said was probably a little, little much, um, but we do have a partner that can help with that. Yeah, hi. So we, uh, for organizations that are, are um, or, or staff that have all those technical expertise can go in and do that implementation themselves, go for it. But if you can't, or feel like you don't wanna spend the hours wrestling with the different um, components or configurations, we do have a service that will, we have a couple different services actually. We have a service that will get you, your organization just set up and get the licenses deployed and uh, your sort of your instance all set up for you and your staff. Um, and then we also have services that will migrate over your email from whatever email platform that you're using today into um, the, uh, the Outlook and, and Exchange Online uh, application and move all that email over. And then we also have a service that will migrate your documents from, again, whatever repository you're using out there, if it's Google Drive or if it's Dropbox or if it's your desktop computer, moving that into um, Teams or SharePoint uh, to make it easier to manage and have kind of that holistic solution. So we offer all those services and those are um, can be found on our website. I can also drop some links in as well. Yeah, if you don't mind dropping the link, that'd be great. Thanks, Cameron. Sure. Okay, so the next question that we have is um, from Wanda. Um, she says, I have a question about error messages that I get from both Adobe Cloud and Microsoft 365 licenses. Um, Wanda, do you have, um, a, do you want to come off of mute and tell us a little bit more about that question? Maybe you start with the Adobe Cloud one and then we can tackle the Microsoft 365 one. Yeah, so this is a case where, can you hear me? We can hear you, yep. Okay. Um, this is a case where the person had a Adobe Cloud license. They decided no longer to use Adobe Cloud, and they went to um, Adobe Pro, uh, PDF Pro, Acrobat, 
Pro just to get the PDF version. So there's some of this Adobe Cloud stuff still hanging around. And now when that person goes to do anything related to their Microsoft 365, you get an error message that this certain file doesn't exist. But if I follow that directory, the file is there. But they're trying to get to a file that does exist, but it keeps giving an error message every time they open either a PowerPoint, a Word doc, mm -hmm. or a yeah, Excel. So I don't know who to talk to. Yeah, Kevin, you were nodding your head. I don't know, Bailey, if you've heard of this too, but Kevin looks like he's heard about this. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Kevin's done this. He's not okay. just so. It's all about versioning. Again, back similar to the Office installation scenario, and and Bailey, correct me if I'm completely off on this. It's just about having existing application file extensions, and within your default menu settings, it's basically pinging an application that doesn't exist anymore because part of it's been deleted, but not all of it's been deleted. So I think this is really just about purging um, existing. Uh, uh, file extensions that are not current application. I've I've done this before, writing trying to write over Adobe Acrobat Pro. So um, I probably should have wish I would have documented it because I had a very similar experience. So um, what is the best place for me to go to get the way to remove the Adobe Suite software so it's not happening anymore? Is there like a link you could send me on how to remove that? Uh, this would really just be about the going into your file directory um, and really just really I would I mean probably searching through there is a good way. I don't know if there's a third party tool, but I, I would just uninstall um, if you have everything backed up in the document cloud, um, which I would highly recommend it's actually my default storage location. Um, if you have everything backed up in the cloud into an existing account, it might be best to just remove everything and then just do a fresh install. And Kevin, maybe if you want one of your questions coming out of it, maybe we can follow up with you directly on that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, great. Was there another part to that question too? There was something... I think it was related to the Microsoft 365 account, but I think they were related, right, Wanda? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Um, Another Wanda that we have, Wanda Bryant says, it's very complicated to use the activation portal. <clears throat> Is it better to use a standalone version of Office for small organizations? Um, Wanda, I'd love to know more about which activation portal that you're talking about, and I'm happy to help answer that question a little bit more. Are you maybe talking um, about- I'm talking about the uh, Microsoft uh, licensing, the um, VLS, mm -hmm. I think it's the VLS. Yeah. Um, and, um, I do have a background in IT and installation, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, I mean, nope. just just getting around in that thing and figuring <laughs> out because it gives you a whole list of applications, you know, in there, uh, making sure that number one, I've selected the um, uh, the correct one, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for for me to install. And then, um, you know, I download the software according to the rules and, you know, I go to, um, uh, you know, I guess install it and, you know, all of these things happen. I have to, you know, redo the password or I have to, you know, it's, 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 totally. it's not accepting my password anymore. Um, now, and, and another question is, um, because I do it as an administrator for my small organization, and we're a small organization, we may have five systems mm -hmm. that are fine. Okay. Um, is it better to name each account that is being installed for differently? Uh, meaning, okay, instead of just using one generic account. Yeah. Um, uh, is it better to use different usernames uh, to install the application? Because that's another issue. Because I do them all, you know, I try to keep it consistent so that A, I know what's going on because, you know, the other people do not. Um, so, you know, that's another issue because what happens is sometimes, it's, you know, when they shut down the system and come back, 
they have to re log into our office, uh, you know, 365 again. Okay, where we never logged out in the beginning, in the beginning yeah. of it, you know, so can somebody help me with that, please? <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> please, absolutely. I'm begging you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, um, we'll put in an email address in here, um, Wanda, and a way that you can kind of schedule some consultation with us. And I think what we can do is walk through what your licensing is right now and understand what might be the best thing. I will just say upfront, we've been doing this for a long time. The Microsoft licensing is super confusing. All of the product oh, yeah. names are super oh, yeah. confusing. And I've been doing like, it for a while also. Yeah. Um, so, so it's like I say, I have an IT background and it right. seemed, you know, and, and, and it seems to be getting you know, a little bit more complicated, especially I was gonna say. my organization is, you know, is relatively small. Yeah, um, and I will and, say and for that, there are, um, it is getting a little bit more complicated and we actually just um, launched a new set of changes to make sure that as Microsoft was changing their fulfillment, we had to change some of our um, ways that we could fulfill too. So it actually, new licenses are, are, are not actually distributed in the VLSC anymore. They're actually directly managed through your Microsoft 365 admin center. But for people mm -hmm. who are acting in an admin role, you're gonna have to do both. So Wanda, mm -hmm. what I'll do is, um, I'll reach back out to you after this and we can go specifically through your um, scenarios. You, I will just say, you. yeah, the, the, <laughs> the question that you have though, I think is relevant to everybody probably thinking about whether or not you want an on-premises solution versus a cloud-based solution. Exactly. And we've done a few webinars on this. And so I'm happy to send some resources on that as well, just to think about that decision. There are definitely pros and cons for each, um, the management of everything. Um, I think the biggest distinction is how your users are using kind of the applications themselves. The on-premises licensing is great for device-based licensing. So it's great if like you're assigning computers and people are using one device to do all of their work. But if people, particularly now with a lot more work from home and remote working and things like that, need to access multiple things on multiple devices, um, leveraging some of the cloud-based solutions and having some of the user-based accounts um, are really helpful for scalability. Most so, of my um, people don't even know what cloud-based is. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but they're probably using a gmail or going on facebook so they are in some yeah, okay ways, right? yeah they are they are you know and they just don't know the name. exactly yeah. but yeah. uh for the most part no they just want to you know create their documents set them you know have them on their on their laptop or whatever and their laptops travel with them so they can access it that's you know really okay. all that they're concerned about so awesome okay so we'll reach back out to you and make thank sure that you. we connect with you yeah thanks Wanda. Um, and I think you also had a question about um, Acrobat, is Adobe Acrobat DC Pro able to run on the MacBook? Um, and I was wondering, Bailey, if you might be able to answer that. It is compatible with Catalina operating system, but you just need to make sure that the Acrobat Pro DC version has been recently updated. So if you can go into your application and check for updates, if it tells you that there need to be any updates, run that and then it should be compatible. Um, Depending it, on when you it's still not working. I'm sorry. It's still not working. Okay. It'll come up and say something went wrong every time. I, you know, and and as I said, you know, I'm not new to this. So, you know, I've actually gone into the library and you know, gotten rid of a few things. And yeah, it's uh it's just really uh very challenging um with the uh, uh just the acrobat, everything else works. Okay. Sorry, I have a dog barking in the background, so I muted <laughs> okay. myself. Um, we will follow up with you because I want to be able to get a, a like a screenshot or like more information on what the error message is telling you, okay, um, and then we can like dive into that together. Thank you. Thank of you. Of course. Okay, great. Thanks, Wanda. Our mm -hmm. next question was from Willow. Um, Willow asks, "What do I do when a Zoom meeting uh, when Zoom tells me I'm already in a meeting when I'm not?" I don't know, Steffi, if you know how to answer that. Uh, yeah, so um, I think my first um, suggestion would be to uh, maybe log out completely out of uh, your Zoom account and then try again. Um, make sure you have the right um, um, meeting ID, the right passcode, the right uh, um, URL, and then try again. If that doesn't work, um, I'm happy to um, also work with you directly on that. And it might be something different where we might have to have need to have Zoom support involved, but this would be my my first um, suggestion. Thanks, Steffi. 
Thank and you. I have that. Yeah. I did try all those things. Um, it was in the middle of a board meeting and we had to <laughs> change rooms. And my oh, board no. was the one that was Zooming, of course, and of got course. up and I couldn't. <laughs> it wouldn't let me log back in with her. It said I was in a meeting and I logged everything off, turned everything down, rebooted because of board president, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and it just kept telling me I was already in a meeting. Are, are, are you running PC? A Windows device? Yes. Uh, do you ever use Task Manager to shut down? It might be running as a background application. That's a big thing oh, with yeah. a lot of these. It's just okay. that you're ensuring that it's not, there's not another instance of it that is trying to boot off of your drive um, or connect to a service. And okay. I get the Slack all the time. I love <laughs> you, but uh, I get that with Slack a lot. Okay, I'll, get, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, but also definitely still reach out too because there might be something, uh, there might be something to it. Um, right. The problem is when it happens, it's always an emergency situation. <laughs> you know, we're supposed yeah. to be doing this right now. Well, that's what, that's what programmers do. So they read and they're coding like detect using AI, detect emergency situation and stop working. So that's <laughs> thanks a lot. No problem. Uh, Teresa has a question. Uh, my question is on SharePoint. How do I set up the access for a team drive so that external users, not set up as an office users, can view, edit, or upload documents? And um, actually, this is a great question. And we went over this a little bit about how to set up guest users in Teams um, at our last um, uh, virtual office hour. So I'm happy to send you um, that recording if we can. I don't know, Matika, if you're able to send a link to that um, in the chat, but um, otherwise we can follow up with you. I don't know, um, Kevin, if you want to do a really quick overview on how to add a guest access in Teams. Yeah, so uh, do, you, do you want me to actually pull up a demo account? I do you have that. Um, maybe just really high level. High level. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, you can actually do this from the admin, uh, the admin portal. Um, you'll go ahead and you'll add guest uh, guest users through the uh, user node in the drop down. You'll it'll redirect you to Azure Active Directory. You will go through this. It's, this doesn't. This is not complicated. It's it's actually one of the easier things to do. So once you're redirected into Azure Active Directory, there'll be a, a box for inviting guest users. Just fill out as much of the information there as you can. It sends an email address to them to let them know that they've been invited. The next step that you're going to need to go into back into the admin portal into the SharePoint uh, ad, ad, admin center specifically, and then you're going to need to go to policies and then to sharing. The you're going to be redirected uh, to an interface that literally just has a slider bar, and then that slider bar you need to make sure that the permission levels is to include at least guest access. It can't be at the lowest level. You have to allow access to guests. That's what opens up SharePoint documents and OneDrive, but essentially that whole hierarchy uh, to guest access. And also within Teams, uh, that will allow the interchanging of documentation uh, to guests that are part of a Teams channel as well. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll get the links and put that in chat because I see Julie also wanted that as well. So happy to do that. OK, um, next question um, is I'm going to go to Sean's question on um, is the pricing for nonprofit E3 licensing going up? I've seen that the normal E3 prices are going up. Great question, Sean. Uh, for what we know right now, the way that Microsoft typically does their discounts is based off of the fair market value of the products and the commercial rates that are offered. So typically, if a um, E3 license for commercial is going up, you will see that kind of same price increase in nonprofit. That hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen those price increases hit the nonprofit sector yet, but my ex expectation is that they will. Um, so usually it's like either 60% or 75% off of the commercial rate. And so that percentage usually stays the same, but since um, the discount itself, uh, if the baseline price increases, I would expect that price to increase as well. So we don't have specific information on that just yet, but I am um, probably confident that that will probably be coming soon if that um, if the changes have already been made live in commercial. So as soon as we do know, we'll obviously make sure that we um, 
you know, send that information out. And usually Microsoft will send that information out. And typically for the nonprofit sector, they usually like to give a grace period of time just to make sure that you have knowledge of any price changes that are coming. So as soon as we hear, we'll make sure that um, we send that information out as well. Is that something where if they announce that and our contract say ends in June, we can re-up for the following year with a new price before the prices will go up? So it will, your prices are locked for a 12 month period. So for your prices won't increase until you would be at your renewal period. Right. But say, say my renewal periods in June and the prices are going to go up in May. Can I re up for the following year before those price increases happen? Uh, I technically you might be able to cancel your licenses and start a new subscription if you're really trying to do something um but i think that would be the only way to do it okay okay thank you yeah no problem um and like i said they'll try to give some time period so maybe you'll have a little bit of time period to figure out the right way to manage that too okay um Leslie asks, how can I learn how to use SharePoint as a document management system? We currently use an in-house server and we are a small business. And I think Mona, you responded to this, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the resources that might be available here. Sure, thanks Ruthie. Uh, so yeah, I did respond with a link uh, to our SharePoint course. Um, so TechSoup Courses is an online training program that we have available for our nonprofits. We have over 30, uh, courses that are all on Microsoft 365. We also have other courses. Um, so I'm actually going to share the email for courses. Um, I highly recommend that you take a look at it. All of our courses are fairly well priced and we try to cover all of the main challenges that we hear from nonprofits. So SharePoint is a great example because the co entire course is built around collaboration uh, using SharePoint, which I think was the exact question, Leslie, that you had. Um, so I'm I'm going to share the email that you could uh, write to if you have any other questions about trainings. Um, I also want to mention that we are currently helping nonprofits uh, get courses access for the, all of their staff because uh, one thing we've learned from nonprofits is that uh, you know it's not just one person in their organization that they want to make all of the courses available to. Um, so you know if you send us an email, uh, we would help you with that as well. Great, thank you. Awesome. Can't see you. Perfect. And I just to let everybody know, there's a few resources that have been posted in chat. Um, a few of the course catalogs are in there, as well as the link to our Microsoft Teams presentation from last session. Um, part of that, you can also like uh, Teams document management actually uses SharePoint as their backend as well. That's how it's integrated into Teams. So you can actually leverage some of that document management and take some of that from that Teams webinar as well. All right, okay. The next question we have is um, from Julie. Um, Julie, I, I know you have a few things about in here. My question, so I just wanted to listen. Oh. No, and I can't Sorry. see because I turned the camera off and now I can't get it back on. Leslie, did you have a question for us? Oh my goodness, you can hear me. Yes, we can. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. That's okay, did you have a like, question for us? You. The okay. Is the link to the email so that I can reach out to you so that the rest of our staff can also learn how to use the, the basics on this new SharePoint. Awesome. Yes. I'll tell you what, I can't get my camera on. That's it has okay. a slash through it. Hold on. I just allowed the camera. You can probably come on. Oh, now so you, you disallowed it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't mean prob to. Probably disallow my. Okay. Thanks, Leslie. Um, okay, so I think the next question was from Julie, and so um, I know you had a couple of questions in here. Um, you're trying to configure a new Microsoft 365 instance to be fully HIPAA compliant for your nonprofit uh, midwifery clinic and birth center. Um, you're struggling to find a clear checklist of relevant configurations. Additionally, at a most basic level, I need to configure password policies that require a certain level of complexity. In an ideal world, I require higher complexity for short characters, but less complexity for longer passphrases. Also, I have set up mail-enabled security groups that include both licensed and external contacts. They can successfully receive DL messages, but if I add the security group to a Word document or something, then the access for the contacts in the security groups do not work. Do the contacts need to be configured for guest users? And I want to maintain access to drive folders with groups by not adding people individually. 
Great questions, Julie. Um, one thing I just wanted to highlight is um, I did put in the chat and I'll link it again, is that um, an administrative guide. So like a step-by-step -step guide for how to set up your Office 365 or Microsoft 365 account. Um, that can be helpful in terms of just like step-by-step -step and showing where in the process you would create the settings um, for a user to like assign roles, privileges, and things like that. But on some of the specific questions, I don't know if any of our team has answers that they want to chime in with right now. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly can. Um, so uh, regarding HIPAA um, and then working off from that first is to make sure that you have the correct type of licensing in place. There are multiple considerations and there'll be tons of resources I give you. I also, by the way, pinned my personal email. I hope you all well, don't mind. I'm happy to field any questions. Um, so really what it comes down to is for me is actually beyond the scope of that. I'm actually going to first start with email security is where I usually like to build off. And then I get into identity and access management, which is to your point uh, about the guests and security groups um, where you start getting into things. I'm not going to go too deep into it just because I'd rather you just follow it up. But just so for the sake of getting out a recording, um, when you set up security groups, you're moving out of security defaults. So one thing that you're going to want to start kind of maybe investing a little time in learning are things called conditional access policies, whether it's a, it's a, to the individuals within that group as a designated user or whether it is somebody who is a guest, you can just create a, a policy, custom policy, and then just apply that policy to a security group. If you're using M365 groups, similar to GPO, like in a non-premise environment, which are group policy objects, you can do it that way too. But it's, 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 it's actually a little bit simpler. Like it's really just about getting into the endpoints and then just manipulating and, and and some of the configurations applying templates to teams there's actually one specifically for healthcare um so there's a lot of things i'm excited there's a lot of things that the, the two of us can talk about um <laughs> get you on track awesome thanks julie does that answer your question or get you started yes i'll be sending an email thank you <laughs> okay awesome all right, um, we have a question. I'm sorry, I think it's from Michael, but um, does Adobe provide a license so that nonprofit employees can use software at home? OK, so um, <laughs> if you are talking about the Acrobat Pro and the Premiere Elements Photoshop Elements, the desktop licenses, those licenses allow for a primary installation and a secondary installation. So you can have it on like a work device and then you can also have it on a home device. The catch is you can't have them running at the same time though. So you need to make sure one computer is like not on and then you can have it on the other <laughs> one. So um, yes, there you go. Yep, and you're talking about Acrobat Pro, so that will be fine. Awesome, thanks Bailey. That's an exciting thing. And I actually think somebody had a similar question. Maybe Michael, it was um, you as well. Uh, that Microsoft used to offer a home license for employees of nonprofits. The price was $9.95 for office professional. Is that still offered? Um, I haven't heard about that, actually. Um, Cameron, I feel like at one point you, you were aware of that benefit. Um, I don't think that still exists, but I'm happy to look into it and see if there's a possibility there. I have not heard of that myself, so happy to look into it. I don't know if anybody else has had experiences or know anything about that, but Michael, I'm happy to follow up. Yeah, it, it was a software assurance benefit. Okay. Um, so it was uh, that the home use program. It was part of the the software assurance, which I believe has no longer in place. Yeah, correct. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think that exists anymore. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, but Michael, with but with cloud with the Office three sixty five licenses, that those are available. So if you have Office three sixty five, you're not constrained from on devices. You can have it up and running on up to five devices. Is it still? Correct. Yeah. It's up to five devices, but it is user account based. So if your yeah. work is setting it up, you're going to use that for your work account. Um, but there are some free Microsoft licenses that are available. Like there's some Teams apps and things like that that are free. But um, I see uh, still very much on device person says so thanks very much. I mm. appreciate that. I will also say, Michael, that a lot of the um, cloud subscriptions include installs of those. So when you want to make the switch, you can do both. Um, 
You also had a question, I think, about um, the last time you tried to install Microsoft Office, the download wouldn't work. There was a new license type called the LTSC, but the description says something about being for medical entities, manufacturers who don't want frequent update. Should nonprofits be using those seats? Um, and we purchased one license for Office Standard, and I noticed that the number of seats in our volume license agreement indicated that only one of the 50 were fulfilled. Does that mean we can use another 49 even though we purchased one? Great questions. Um, so yes, it is called the LTSC license right now. And that license um, is typically meant for like longer term use. The functionality is actually pretty much um, the same. And yeah, um, Kevin has some resources there as well. And I'm happy to send a little overview of the distinction between them. But this license is the one that's now available as a donation. So it's the one we, um, that Microsoft recommends that nonprofits use and has made available as a donation. Um, it also is um, very similar in terms of the applications and work that um, micro, the Office Standard, both home and Office Standard Professional um, kind of have as applications. Um, in terms of the... Um, the licenses in VLSC, um, they have like a count there, but if you have a 50 quantity restriction and you've only um, requested one, you can request more licenses, but you have to request a different license itself. So you can't just use, um, you can't just purchase one and then use it 49 times. You have, if these are device-based licenses. So as soon as you install that onto a device, you're gonna need another license to be able to install it onto another device. I hope that answers your question. Okay. I think that actually covers all of the questions that we saw in chat. Um, if anybody wants to come off of mute or if anybody has other questions, please feel free to keep um, you know, going through or asking any other questions or just come off of mute and say hi and, and ask us if you have any other questions. Hi, um, I do have a, um, another question. This is Teresa. Sure. Uh, so it has to do with um, office licensing. So our free M Microsoft 365 account has like 10 business license yeah. and 10, I forget what it's called, but that no longer is, one of them is no longer uh, offered. So mm -hmm. so we basically have 20 users and uh, we're running out of, the, out of these license. And I would like to move some of those people off of the, you know, those oh, license and make them guest users. Um, so if I move them off, am I going to lose those since they're not offered anymore? So what I would suggest is that you unassign the user from that license. So you keep the license and then you can assign it to another user. Um, then you won't lose the subscription. If you were to cancel it, then you'll lose the cancellation and you'll lose that offer. So like it's probably an E2 license that you're on, I would assume, or yeah. an E1 license. Yeah, something like that. Yes. Yeah, an E1 or E2 license where they are no longer available as a donation, but you're grandfathered in. So if you have an existing subscription, you can use it um, and you can use it up to a cap of 2000 seats. So if you want to move those people that you currently have, I would just unassign the user from that license so you can keep those licenses, but you're not necessarily um, assigning it to the user. OK, thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Um, I, I don't have a question necessarily, but um, I think you I had said that you would get with me about um, the VLS, uh, at, you know, at the end. I have to run out. Can we do that another at another Absolutely. time? Um, yeah, and, I'll send you an email. Okay. And the person that was going to help with the Adobe as well, um, the um, um, Acrobat installation, um, sure. they, ne they needed to see um you know what error i was receiving can yep. you send me an email so that i can get back with you um you know at a later time because i am going to be running out right after this no problem yeah we'll absolutely follow up with email but with you this is awesome there. i am so grateful this is i, I <laughs> i'm so grateful to you all because you know what it's like trying to get in we do tech support <laughs> by noon and you know, on and on and on. And also, yeah, this is awesome. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. So, so you're um, going to run them like what, once a month maybe? or We try to run them once a month. Um, yeah, we usually have different topics, but we're we're here and we'll, we're happy to have you at oh, all the, of this yeah. session. This, this, yeah. is very, this has been uh, very, very helpful. Thank you Oh, so I'm so much. glad. Thanks, Wanda. And we'll re reach out to you soon. Okay, thank you.
OK, um, I think Teresa, you may have come off of mute before you were going to ask another question, maybe. Yes, I, I didn't want to monopolize the whole no, thing. It's Other fine. people had questions. So um, my next question is on emails. Uh, so right now, our email accounts are hosted by, you know, a, a domain uh, mm -hmm. uh, company. Uh, and so I would like to get off of that to save costs since I think Microsoft allows emails. And I noticed that you posted something about my email migration. Um, so is there a limit to the number of, you know, email accounts that were allowed under the, you know, the Microsoft free account? Um, yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it will be based off of the licensed user. So it's as many licenses as you have. So under the Microsoft 365 business premium, you have 10 users with your E1 and E2 licenses. Like I said, you have the uh, 2000 cap, but depends on how you want to use those. So you have the ability to have licenses for those. Um, I don't know, um, Cameron, or uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about some of the email migration services that we do have. Sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we do. I mean, I, I talked about it a little bit before. We have the ability to do email migration um, from, you know, whatever platform or whatever service that you're using into uh, into Office 365. We also actually do have Google. We can help organizations move into uh, Google Mail for the um, the Google for nonprofits offer, and so that's a that's an additional service that we can we can support. Okay. Did I miss part of the question there? No, you're good, Cameron. Okay. Well, is it all right if I if I inquire who the mail host is? Is this? <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, you, you can type it in if you if you prefer <laughs> not to say. We're oh, not no, gonna say names. So. It's in motion. Okay. Um, okay. Which yeah. is you know. Oh, I know who they are? Yeah. It's yeah, been I great. Know. You know, I don't I don't have a problem with with them. It's just you know if. if uh, we used to have them host our website. We don't anymore. We moved to WordPress.com. And so I thought, you know, why not move the emails as well and just end that subscription? Huh. That actually segues into something that I could probably go off on a small tangent about that. So um, can I do I, do I got 30 well, we seconds? Don't, we, don't have a, we don't have an open question, so people get ready and we'll give Kevin a, his uh, pitch to go on his tangent. So... <laughs> Uh, in motion, Bluehost, GoDaddy, any type of hosted thing, they get stacked together. They're bundled. Great price, first year, second year. What just happened to my bill? Um, it's very common. So, uh, to Cameron's point, either moving it to a host like Exchange on 365, moving it to a host as part of Google Workspace and Gmail are are great ideas. The next step, though, that I kind of I start immediately thinking about, especially for like SMB style orgs, is I go, OK, well, I have a WordPress site. Do I really want to pay for hosting it? Well, uh, Julie's here, uh, Route 53, AWS service. Why not use a credit and have it paid for in part or even try to maybe Azure Web Services? I'm not going to go too deep down the rabbit hole, but just know that there's like uh, like multiple roads that lead to Rome, and that would be <laughs> mail hosting application, um, website. Like if you've got web hooks, like with that include A or AA record configurations. A lot of our partners have a solution to house all of that. Some will cover the majority or even possibly all the cost, but some will at least help you defer a healthy portion of it. So that's definitely like. I know that people don't normally approach it like that. They've got something here, they've got something here, they've got something here. Well, Microsoft, uh, Google, and AWS, that you could kind of one-stop shop, like everything that you do in theory and kind of just, you know, get them to leverage some of those things. Mm, okay, I mean, that's good to think about. I mean, I think we moved to WordPress.com because you know, we don't have any IT staff and I wanted, you know, to have good support. And so, but yeah, maybe once everything settles down, that'd be good to consider. Yeah, I, I'll also call out that we do have a website um, yeah. consultation and, and management service through TechSoup. It's um, also on our website and 
where you can get a consultation about your website, um, a, a you know project work, any any updates or anything that you need to have done to your website, and then also um, a, a full kind of management where you know we act as your as your basically your webmaster and and help kind of maintain and manage your website, including managing your website security, which is um, something that's quite important. Is that a, an hourly costing or is that, um, how does that service work? Uh, yeah, it starts out with a consultation and, um, Mona, I'm trying to remember if the consultation is free or paid. I I'm, think it's, I think the wellness assessment is free and then yeah. the consultation is at uh, $49 or at least yeah. starting at 49 Yep. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Should be um, so. Basically, the wellness, uh, the wellness consultation, what we call it, is just it's a it's an automated tool. So if you plug in your website information, it gives you this very deep free report on all the things that you need to update uh, on your website. So we highly recommend that you do that. That's free. Um, once you do that, and you still want a consultation, I believe the consultation is priced at forty nine dollars. Um, and what uh, the consultant is able to do is take that report and actually give you very targeted uh, consultation on kind of areas uh, of weakness in your website. You can also ask the consultant about any other needs that you have. Um, so um, I think starting with that wellness report and a consultation is a great idea um, before diving into any larger project. OK, thank you. Sure. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Anybody want to come off mute and ask anything that's burning in your head? All right. Well, I'm really grateful for you all to join us. Oh, Ruth has a question. Ruth, feel free to come off of mute. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. I had to come in late in this meeting. I did ask a question. It may have been answered early on. Will there be a recording of this that I can uh, go through? Just yes, sure. the recording. And um, uh, please let us know what your question is. I, I think it's fine if you want to ask it again, but there will be a recording and, and uh, we'll send that over to you as well. OK, I'll have to go back here and look. Uh, Ruth, was your question the one? Um, are you are you from the um, Oasis uh, Oasis Sanctuary? Yeah, um, yes. we did answer that up front, and okay. um, there are a few resources available to you about um, installing that. Um, and uh, Kevin actually talked a little bit about some of the um, ways that you can do that, uh, I, but we can follow up with you. And then there's also a guide in the chat that was posted, so you can use that as well. That's wonderful. It, it, as someone else said, when we're trying to be our own in-house IT people with I know. very little burdens, <laughs> it becomes a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I completely understand. And one thing I just would want to say too is that we completely get that that's not like not everybody has an IT staff. We do also have help desk services that you can use to just get one off help desk support because we know everybody's not there or you can get bundles or monthly services as well. So um, they're low cost. They're meant for nonprofits and they're meant for the uses cases that many of us have. So um, we'll put a link in. I think I put a link for the services, but I'll put it in there again. Um, and then Ruth, if um, you have any follow up questions from that, just feel free to um, come back and ask us. I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, no problem. Um, Bishop, I see your hand up as well. Would you like to answer, ask your question? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me OK? Yep, we can hear you fine. Uh, once again, also, sorry, came in late. Um, okay. So if you've already answered it, I'll just get the answer later. But we have a, um, a global organization, uh, Mr. Church. And what we tried to do was I tried to use, we, we started with Microsoft Teams. Mm -hmm. um, in order to utilize that for all of us worldwide. And so I wanted to use my phone for just the regular phone so I could always be on my headset, not have to keep going back and forth to the phone. So I ordered the micro, your Microsoft, um, I think it was called, uh, it was the calling plan yeah, um, yeah. that gets attached to it. And I have a background uh, in IT. And I wasn't mm -hmm. able to get it to work. Yeah. So I ended up canceling it. Um, 
is there, what would you suggest? I really want to do it, but I didn't want to pay the $15, $16 a month that it's costing me um, and not be able to use it because I spent two days going yeah. through the, the the knowledge base and getting all of the little steps they told me to get through and it just would not work. So um, do you have any suggestions for me? Do we need to pay for help to get it set up? Um, what do we need to do? If you've answered it, just tell me to go we to the We notes. definitely have not answered that. So um, I, I think I'll pass it off to Kevin because he unmuted himself and I call that volunteering. But um, <laughs> uh, I would also just say that um, thinking about that in a global setting might also be part of it. Like um, if you have global accounts, the, the phone calling plans are actually like specific to countries in a lot of ways because they're tied to your PBX or you're tied to your phone provider. So a lot of those working globally, there are audio conference um, add-ons that might be worthwhile to look at as well. But um, I'll let Kevin kind of talk through that a little bit more. Yeah, th that's actually perfect. So the first consideration is going to be country because we actually have a partner that we work with um, and there are certain teams calling functionality that surprisingly, even though they're neighbors, uh, do not have call in or one doesn't have call out. So uh, audio conferencing is, is a separate feature that enables landline users to call in. Uh, it's also available on Zoom. Um, I, I don't even know if Zoom it might even be natively integrated. I'm not 100% uh, sure about that, but so it really comes down to uh, as far as phones like PSTN, PBX, like you bringing a service in. Now you can have a team's business voice without calling minutes and you can buy communication credits. Um, this will be a longer conversation, but just to get some of the, the higher uh, level terms just out there on recording, um, it's you're either bringing in an existing service or you're treating Microsoft like your service provider. Uh, and that's where the business voice with minutes and the price range that you had mentioned that includes 3000 minutes. As of now, cellular carriers cannot be brought in. It will require a, a full teleco and not like a, a mobile service provider. Verizon, for example, does have its own division that it acts as a PSTN, but you couldn't bring a Verizon uh, mobile uh, carrier account in as of yet. I've heard some discussion about possibly enabling that, but you'd actually, again, have to have an existing phone service that you're bringing in, or you'd have to pay for the minutes. All right. So that means that because we don't have, maybe that was the issue, because we don't have a landline system at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I utilize my cell phone because we travel from state to state and, and and we're very mobile because it's an online church. So right. so you're telling me then that the um, cellular system that I have with Verizon isn't going to work anyway. So I got the one that had with the minutes. I got the one, the calling plan with the minutes. It's 1560, I believe, a month. And um, and I thought I could use as a PBX. I thought I could yeah, use you teams. Have to Mm -hmm. You have to create a DID. I, again, I don't really want to get too complicated. Like right now, okay. you're definitely gonna, it's going to be great to talk with you. Uh, you're going to need to create a, a DID, but you could also then configure things like auto attendant uh, and caller connect. Um, I'm not a Teams Teams expert, um, but I get enough of this where um, there's a couple things you'll have to configure and set up on the back end, but I've got a ton of Teams resources. Um, because I did go to the MS 700 boot camp, so I can pass that along too. Um, and uh, we'll figure this out. All right. So you tell me what to do then. So I wait for your call, or do I call somebody else? Or what I do you email need me to do? and chat, and then we're also going to be providing uh, additional contact information. But you could just reach out to me because I think this is probably something that's going to come my way anyway. So and I'm happy to help. Now, the last question that I have in that vein is because I am using this for the first time, um, mm -hmm. where is chat and where, do I, <laughs> where okay. do I get that information? Upper right corner, if you start with the big, beautiful red leave button, yeah. Yeah. if you just work your, if you work your way over to the second to last icon on the left from there next to the two people, that is the chat. It'll pull up this, that on the uh, right side dashboard. And yes, I got it. It's in there. All right, then that's Kevin Mulhall. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I just repaying Kevin's address in here. Um, so um, feel free. Um, it's I, I also it's a very question. interesting. It's a very interesting thing. I think it's still kind of like in its infancy. So 
Yeah. I think that once, perhaps, hopefully, fingers crossed, they let you bring um, personal mobile carriers into the mix. Um, that is, that's really going to be game changing. Um, it's just going to have to. There's going to be some configuration challenges again, like I mentioned, the configuring DID. So we'll see what happens with that. I'll also say that I think there's a Microsoft 365 business voice component that just came out as well. So it might be um, good to explore that because it might be a little bit more cost effective. I'm not sure, though. That's the one I used. Oh, OK, got it. It's fifteen dollars and sixty cent a month with a calling plan. Yeah, so there's there's with and without calling minutes. The one yeah. that's out, I believe, is three eighty. Um, but or somewhere between somewhere between 380 and like five dollars. I want maybe it's five. I'm not gonna I don't want to misquote, but um that's a maybe a, a slightly more complicated connection. And there's there's ways to writing it routing things too. It's like understanding what protocols that phone is traveling on, like UDP. Again, long discussion, but um again, we're we're all about figuring things out. So all righty. Thank you. Thanks, Bishop. And I know we only have a few minutes left, but I see a um, question from Julia in chat. Um, when will Microsoft Voice Lines be able to receive text messages? We switched from Google Voice and the number was set up to get text two-factor authentication codes. And now those don't go through to anywhere. Um, and sometimes clients text the business number and they get no feedback that their message is not received. Um, I'm not entirely sure on this one. I don't know, Kevin, if you've heard about this, but the one thing I would also say is that Microsoft has an authenticator app that you can use for two-factor authentication. So if you don't have, um, you know, if you're switching or if it, you should be able to get text messages on the two-factor authentication, but uh, there's also an authenticator app that you can download on your phone to get those codes and you can use that when you're enabling it. And that's a, a an acceptable <clears throat> form. To clarify, this is like, other third party sites. So I configured a business account at, you know, do my work dot com and I mm -hmm. set up 2FA and I put the business account and when it was Google Voice, I could receive a text message to that number and and authenticate in when it required 2FA. Actually, I think specifically the account that's currently kind of stuck is my Stripe account. It's Stripe. It. So like I set up this phone line to be used for 2FA and yeah. then I didn't realize and I switched it to Microsoft Voice and now I can't get the message and I have to go dig through all I my work to find my like last ditch resort special super duper security code that I was supposed to never lose and it's <laughs> not lost it just is not located yet. <laughs> um, okay, I I um I would probably need to research this. I don't know, Kevin, if you know anything I can so dig in this for You know, normally, so I mean, I, I just did a test too. I texted our business line from just my regular cell phone number. And it no, it doesn't even give me like a message not delivered message. You know, like mm. normally if you text a phone line that can't get text messages, you get some kind of feedback that totally. nobody's going to do this. Yeah. But it just it just sends as a message and it, it looks totally fine on my outbound, you know, on my iPhone from my cellular provider. There's no message that's not received. And so I'm sure there are people trying to contact us and we have no idea because they're just assuming that a text is going to be accepted because that's just the world we live in now. Yeah. So is this this voice that your uh, voicemail system that you're attempting to access uh, with uh, with MFA? This is this a voicemail that's set up as part of uh, Microsoft Business Voice Plan? No, no, I'm not trying to access voicemail. I'm just trying to access so my your my Skype account. OK, yeah. so other applications. Yeah, so the equivalent to that, like would be if you're using Intune, you could you could configure mobile application management and then just I would honestly personally set up. It's called SSO, like seamless sign-on. Uh, we actually yes, also I have am. A we're we're still in our early that. stages, and I am looking yeah. into single sign-on options right now. But but regardless, I'll, like even if I figure out the single sign-on piece and I fix all totally my existing yeah. accounts, that this is the two like where I want to use the business number as a as a backup two yep. FA number. Like you even need if to that's have, all you resolved, need to have text like, messages. If a client yeah, like I get me, it. Yeah. I want them to either get feedback that I didn't get the message or I want to get yeah. the message. <laughs> totally. I'll, I'll research that, Julie. Like I think that's a that would be insane for them not to be able to at least have on their roadmap of functionality. So let me go back and kind of see if I can find any more information on that and then I'll reach back out if we can. Thank you. 
Awesome. Okay. Well, I you know we're at time. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, it's helpful to get your feedback so we know if we should do more types of these things. Thank you to our TechSoup team who came in today to help answer all of these questions. Um, very much appreciated. And we hope this was helpful. And thank you guys for your time. Um, and because this was on Teams, you can go back and look through the chat at any point and you can get those resources again. We will email you all of this so you'll have all of these resources, links, everything that we shared available to you as well. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.